Stanford University. So actually, I think I'll just sit down now because Brian just gave my talk. Uh, I'm kidding. So uh, I am going to tell you about um, how we are trying to solve a problem that a lot of people said was ridiculous. And that is, how do we access and modulate brain circuitry in freely moving human subjects with Parkinson's disease to develop precise targeted therapies? So if I ask you to reach out and pick up a cup, or if you think of just getting up and walking out to get another cup of tea or something, you don't really think about it. So when we develop, we, we learn movements that we then store as sort of automatic programs. For instance, when you're walking through a doorway or walking through a crowded mall, you really don't think about how you navigate. And many of you, like people in these photos, might have extended your motor repertoire a little further to have well-practiced, more complex movements. And as you know, if you're in a performance situation or a race, you really don't want to think about those movements. You, you really want to just implement them. And I have been fascinated by how the brain does this since I was doing these very nasty ballet exams as a teenager, and the ballet mistress would just do this. And there was no words, and the music started, and we had to do it on point. And it was always marvelous to me that I actually did it without thinking about it. So I've always been interested in how the brain controls movement, but I'm also very interested in what happens when it goes wrong. And there's a disease called Parkinson's disease that was described by James Parkinson in 1817 and is exemplified by this gentleman here who has resting tremor and he has slow movement. He has difficulty performing a simple finger tapping task. And you can see that brings out the tremor on the other side. And he has difficulty rotating his, his hand. These are called, this is called slow movement or bradykinesia. But really what's really quite dramatic as the disease goes on is that in Parkinson's disease, people find it difficult to recruit not only complex movements, but these well-learned automatic movements that we take for granted, such as getting out of a chair or walking. For this gentleman, he need two people to assist him. It took about 100 years before it was discovered that in fact, due to degeneration of dopaminergic neurons in the midbrain, there was actually uh, maladaptive neural activity in these deep regions of the brain called the basal ganglia and in the circuitry in the sensory motor network. So what are the challenges and opportunities if you want to go ahead and investigate what is the neural activity responsible for complex movement disorders such as in Parkinson's disease? And if you think about this like an engineering problem, then if you want to investigate something, the first thing you need is some computerized objective and validated output. So in the case of Parkinson's disease, you need to have objective validated measures of these complex movements in human subjects. And when I moved from my postdoc with Steve Lisberger, where I was studying motor learning in the vestibular ocular reflex in primates, back to the human, I found that the way we use to measure movement in Parkinson's disease was with clinical rating scales, which albeit were very good and comprehensive, were not really of the resolution needed for an engineering solution. How are you going to access and record neural activity in these deep regions in awake human subjects? And how do you measure both the neural activity and movement in real time in freely moving people? And if you can do that, can you figure out what the neural signatures are of abnormal movement and use them to drive smarter, responsive, or closed-loop neurostimulation for Parkinson's disease, which basically might act as a template for a wider range of neuropsychiatric diseases. So the first problem. One of the wonderful things about working with human subjects, apart from the fact that they're wonderful people to work with, is that they can do complex movement without much training. And many of the animal scientists here will understand what I'm saying. It takes a while to train a monkey to do a movement. But the problem is, how do you measure complex movements quantitatively in the human and then in neurological disorders that cause, that cause movement disorders? So for quite a while, and I can't show you all the data here, but we have been working on this in my lab. 
And we targeted the development of computerized objective measures of movement really to the clinical rating scale in Parkinson's disease that we wanted a measure of fine motor control, which we initially did with a repetitive alternating finger tapping task, which is a trill, it's a fairly well-learned movement uh, on a MIDI keyboard, and we've subsequently developed and built our own engineered keyboard. And from this, we can actually see all the movement problems that you see in Parkinson's disease. And actually, we validated this with a clinical rating scale, and this is actually one of the most sensitive ways of measuring even large-scale movement disorders. And we can measure tremor, we can measure bradykinesia, we can measure freezing behavior. We've been using wearable sensors for a very long time. You can strap them onto the limbs. We use them in the operating room, we use them in the clinic now. And we've always used, uh, up until recently, uh, a solid state gyroscope because Steve Lisberger drummed it into my head that the brain codes for velocity. And so I've always measured a velocity measuring device. Uh, and we've also used uh, dual force plates to measure more axial motor control in Parkinson's disease, such as balance. And now we've developed the first metric for actually something called freezing of gait, which I'll show you as we go on in the talk, where the patients are doing a repetitive stepping in place task. So we've done a lot of work and it's led to a lot of very interesting discoveries. So here are the challenges. Here's another uh, lady with Parkinson's disease who's having great difficulty in that very automatic movement for getting out of the chair. And now as you see as she walks, she has very short stepped gait because she has postural instability. Her whole axis has to move without much AP sway. And you'll see that when she tries to turn, she freezes. And here are the challenges. Parkinson's disease is a progressive neurological disorder. It affects not only the sensory motor networks, but it also affects limbic or mood networks, associative networks or cognitive circuitry, and the autonomic nervous system. And how do you access this circuitry in the human subject? Well, here's the opportunities. Here's the same person about six months after she received deep brain stimulation, which is basically the implantation of a brain pacemaker. And what we do is we implant a deep brain stimulating lead in, into the deep regions of the brain. And when we turn it on, this lady's not using any medication. You see that wonderful walking pattern look very normal. And so the reason that we now can record from this deep brain circuitry is that we now can use what the brain has as far as organized, physiological, and topographically separated uh, signatures of sensory motor, uh, of the sensory motor circuitry, the limbic circuitry, and the associative circuitry, which is separated somewhat anatomically in the brain. And really, that is the only reason that we can actually use deep brain stimulation as a therapy for the motor disorders and Parkinson's disease. So we use this clinically, and we can also use this now in our research. And so this is just a schematic to show you this, where these leads go. They go deep into the brain. They're connected by an extension to a regular pacemaker-looking pulse generator or implanted neurostimulator. This is what Dr. Jamie Henderson, who has really pioneered the frameless-based method for targeting these deep brain structures. And here we are with a wearable sensor on the patient's foot and arm, and we're moving all the joints of the contralateral limb and recording from the brain, and I'll show you that in a minute, to, in order to map out this sensory motor region. But as you know, this is a fairly challenging thing to do. The subthalamic nucleus is this little, little nucleus deep in the brain, and to do that, to do this work, even to do the clinical work, we have to go in uh, with this fine microelectrode and do extracellular recording from the units um, in the subthalamic nucleus. And from this, we can get very nice uh, single unit traces. And we actually work in a Faraday cage in, at Stanford. It's a shielded operating room, so we have wonderful signal to noise ratio. Uh, and as you can see, here is a, uh, a sort of graphic of what I'm doing with mapping. I, I look like I'm moving the foot, but this is actually wrist extension. And here's the angular velocity of a rapid wrist extension movement. And the neuron I'm recording for is clearly activated. And so I literally march up and down the body, and I can map out the sensory motor region. So that's the clinical piece. What we can also do is measure something called the local field potential. And that really is the local electrical uh, network. And that could be uh, afferents coming in from other regions. But it's more of a sort of mesoscale type of electrical activity. And from now on, everything I will be talking about in this talk is, the is in, in terms of the local field potential. So this work has been done extensively in 
non-human primate and in rodent models of Parkinson's disease and in humans. And it has been shown that, in fact, in the frequency band of about 8 to 30 hertz, which is the canonical alpha and beta band, there appears to be oscillations and exaggerated synchrony in Parkinson's disease. Now, a lot of people jumped on this about 15 years ago and said, ah, we have the first biomarker of Parkinson's disease, and we've approached this fairly skeptically. So we set, aside, we set out to do a prospective study of everybody who was coming through the operating room who consented. And after we'd placed the leads, we did what we call a resting state uh, recording. And out of 130 STNs, we actually found evidence of oscillatory, oscillatory activity in this beta band in all but one of them. And what is that? Well, here is a recording from the, here is the subthalamic nucleus, and here is the deep brain stimulating lead. So this is a tetrode, it has four electrodes on it, and we're basically looking in from the side here. And we can record directly from this lead, and here's a time frequency spectrogram, basically the hotter colors mean high power, and here the bottom trace is from the most ventral electrode pair, the middle trace is from of electrodes one to two, and the top trace is from electrodes two to three. And you can see that there seems to be increased power in this band here around the beta region. This is just a different way of describing this. This is basically a power spectral density diagram with uh, power on the y-axis and frequency on the x-axis. Here's that ventral channel pair that it has not very much power in it. Here's that channel one to two that seems to have most of the power. And here's the dorsal pair that has less but still um, increased power. And so you would probably naturally say to me, well, how do you know this is not normal? And the answer is I don't. Um, but in animal models, there and actually there's still debate about this, but in animal models, there certainly doesn't appear to be such exaggerated oscillations in non-Parkinsonian rodents. Uh, but we don't normally do this kind of recording in people who don't have Parkinson's disease. But just to give you an idea, our brain wants to synchronize different parts of it together. That is how we function. We will transiently synchronize different regions of the brain to think, to have emotions, to move. But what we don't want to do is we don't want to be locked in one frequency band of synchrony persistently and in an exaggerated sense. And this is actually, in my opinion, this is something that is not an all or nothing uh, situation. So going through the talk, we may not want to completely wipe this out, but we, we do seem to want to lower this type of synchrony in the Parkinson's brain. So this received a lot of attention in the literature, and Peter Brown's group uh, in London and then in Oxford were some of the pioneers here. And what they did is they can actually externalize the leads after the operating room, and they can record from this deep brain circuitry in the days in between implanting the leads and then implanting the pacemaker. And so what they can do, the patient's still tethered but they can give the patient their usual dose of medication, and they can ask whether, in fact, this bad, bad guy, this beta arrhythmia, goes away. So here's an example of a, the beta rhythm in the off-drug state, and you can see in the on-drug state, it is attenuated, and in this situation, it's attenuated in the beta regions, and actually, there's a gamma band that appears. And this led them to say that gamma's prokinetic and beta's akinetic. And we were, again, fairly skeptical about this. And we said, OK, so there's another therapy that makes people better, as I just showed you, and that's deep brain stimulation. So if you, if you, you should see attenuation of this rhythm with deep brain stimulation as well. That was a little hard to do initially because you couldn't record the signals in the beta band during high frequency stimulation because of the stimulation artifact. But once we solved that problem, and Alberto Priori and his group did this first in Italy, um, we used an, basically a filter and we stimulated this a little small, but this is a diagram of the lead. We stimulated through one electrode, we recorded around it. We then did a randomized presentation of different voltages in the operating room of deep brain stimulation. Um, out, this is a ramp up to check for side effects. And as we did this, we saw that there was a nice voltage dependent attenuation of this beta band. And the attenuation really asymptoted out at the clinical voltages. And this was work that was initially started by Camille de Salage uh, in my lab, taken on by Diane Whitmer and Anka Velasar. So we asked some more questions in the operating room. Our exaggerated and persistent beta oscillations, a feature of the distributed sensory motor network, is all very fine if we're sitting recording in the subthalamic nucleus and it's just a property of the subthalamic nucleus, but we've got to make the whole sensory motor network behave better. And if so, 
Is the subthalamic nucleus acting like a node? And such that when we stimulate in the subthalamic nucleus, can we attenuate this rhythm throughout the sensory motor network? Well, to do that, we first have to figure out what is the connected sensory motor network, and can we do this? Again, fairly challenging in the human subject. And so these, uh, this literature just, we've done a fair amount of work looking at recordings in the STN, showing in fact that there seem to be signature rhythms within a patient where the signals between the two STNs were very similar and actually coherent, but were different among individuals, suggesting that the two STNs were linked in this bad rhythm. And as we know, there's no anatomical connection between the subthalamic nuclei. There has to be a third actor. We were uh, having lots of fun with Carl and Viviana Gradianaru at this time, bouncing back ideas. And so once uh, they had an idea that this hyperdirect pathway from the motor cortex to the subthalamic nucleus might be very important to modulate as the mechanism of therapy for DBS, uh, Jamie Henderson and I set about to do a fairly challenging experiment in the operating room. And initially, he and Scott Atlas did diffusion tractography to identify the sites on the motor cortex that seem to be the site of the origin of this hyperdirect pathway, which is a monosynaptic pathway that goes actually from many regions of the cortex to the subthalamic nucleus. So the subthalamic nucleus is a really important little node uh, in the basal ganglia. And once they did that, uh, he and our physicist Bruce Hill uh, developed a little introducer so that Jamie could actually slip a cortical strip electrode, which is used a lot for epilepsy recordings, underneath the burr hole and line it up over these DTI uh, projection, efferent projection sites. We then proceeded to implant both of the STN leads, and then we did recording from both STNs and the cortical strip, asking the question, is there some functional connectivity in electrophysiological terms, that means coherence, in the beta band? And if we stimulate in the STN, do we affect the, the beta band in the cortex? And without showing you all the data sides, the answer is yes, in fact, the site of maximum coherence between the two STNs was also the site of maximum coherence with that uh, efferent projection site. And in fact, when we applied randomized presentations of voltages in the subthalamic nucleus, we attenuated the ipsilateral cortical beta only over the, the projection sites, because in one lead, it actually slipped. And it was only after we'd analyzed the data, thinking that maybe this wasn't going to be a real finding, Jamie came back to us and said, oh, I've just done the reconstructions. And one lead slipped. And in actual fact, it was the one where we did not see this effect. So this was actually very interesting work in the operating room, suggesting that the whole sensory motor network seems to be locked in this persistent, exaggerated beta band, beta rhythm. So this is all very fine and good. We've done lots of work in the operating room. But really, um, and this was really the only time we could access deep brain circuitry when le the leads were externalized and the subject are tethered to the to cables and they're lying down in the operating room, at least in the, in the USA. And as you know, with research in the operating room, it's not exactly your ideal laboratory. It's time limited. The subjects can't get up and move around. We've already done a procedure. They're tired. And it's a very expensive experimental setting. So how do you access brain circuitry to measure neural and kinematic activity in real time and while humans are freely moving? And this was not possible until, as Brian said, we had this wonderful development that Medtronic used the FDA-approved generator and then put firewall-protected software, sensing software on it, which could actually sense the local field potentials and download them right onto the device. And using telemetry, we could then download those onto a recording tablet and so they asked for a request for proposals. And ours was to investigate the neural signatures of tremor, bradykinesia, and freezing behavior in Parkinson's subject with bilateral subthalamic nucleus uh, implantation. And we did the first uh, subject in the United States about three years ago. I do have to have a shout out to our friends at UCSF in case anybody's here. They did do their first one the next day, but we got in first. <laughs> <laughs> we can't usually say that. Um, and since then, we've, had, we've implanted 21 subjects, which is the largest cohort in the world. So now we have many more opportunities. We can now access brain circuitry in freely moving human subjects using a sensing neurostimulator. And there are two major ways we can go. One is we investigate the neural basis for these Parkinson's disease and other neuropsychiatric diseases. And Helen Mayberg is doing this in Emory with depression, and others are doing it in OCD. Um, we can also use brain or kinematic signals of abnormal behavior to develop the first closed-loop brain pacemakers. 
Sounds easy. But here's the first ever readout of somebody who is, has synchronized video and a readout of both subthalamic nuclei as he's standing. And then as he walks, you can see the rhythm changes right away. And then he's going to stand again. So just once you see it, you think, oh my goodness, how could we never have known that? But I treat patients and I constantly think about what's going on in their brain when I'm looking at them, but it's as if I'm completely blind. And so is the neurostimulator. It has no idea what it's doing. But now, all of a sudden, we can see in real time what, what is going on in the brain, at least in this little subthalamic nucleus, as people move freely about the lab. We're trying to make him freeze by making him walk through these barriers, in case anyone was wondering. We can also now do some more careful experiments. And so imagine if you are sitting and I ask you to do this, and you probably don't think very much about doing it. Um, and what we do is we have the angular velocity sensor on the wrist. And as this person is moving, they're getting a little slower. And as you can see, here's their resting state band. And as they move, it suddenly drops out. And then a very different band appears. We turn on deep brain stimulation. The band is attenuated. They get better. We turn it off. The movement band comes back. And the resting band also comes back when they stop. So all of a sudden, this is the first time we're seeing that there actually is something different going on when you move. And I don't have time to discuss all of this. But just to say one thing is, if you're going to use this for closed loop, you're going to have to use, make sure you know which band to use. Because if you're going to do, use the resting state band and they go off walking around, that might not be the best band to use. I told you we developed a metric of freezing of gait. And I'm just going to quickly take you through this. This is somebody doing a repetitive stepping in place task on dual force plates. We've normalized the force to their body weight so that 100% here means for that foot, they're putting all their weight on that foot. And the other foot is 180 degrees out of phase, and it's basically at 0%. And so they alternate like that. And it's not difficult to write a computer algorithm to then detect when they don't get their feet off the force plate, which is here and here. And that is when they are frozen. What's interesting here, which had never been seen before, is that actually what you can see here is there's still clearly a neural signal coming down, trying to shift weight, these people. Although when you look at them, they look like they're just frozen. So all of a sudden, we have the way now, seeing we have synchronized neural recordings to investigate whether there are differences when you're freezing but shifting and when you're not shifting. And basically, here's the resting state, which is standing. Here's the movement in the green when they're not freezing, this pattern. And here's the movement in the red when they are freezing. And I think you can get a glimpse that there appears to be slightly higher peak here in high beta regions during the periods of freezing. Now, the other thing you can do that's fairly exciting is you could only access the brain circuitry times one in the operating room, and then everything's closed up. But now we can access the brain circuitry and ask, if this is a band, a biomarker of Parkinson's disease, does it change over time? And if we're using deep brain stimulation, does that constant high-frequency neurostimulation exert any effect on this resting state beta band? And so Megan Trager in my lab did this study that we call the washout study, where we do this every three months. And we turned the patient off this stimulation and recorded every 15 minutes for 60 minutes or until the subsequent uh, PSDs were overlapping. In actual fact, what we showed, that there was a significant attenuation of the resting state off therapy beta band. Here it is before we started DBS. And here it is at 6 and 12 months, after 6 and 12 months of DBS. And we also interestingly saw that their clinical rating scale was getting better off therapy. And the reduction in the beta band was correlated with the improvement in the motor score. So this is a very, very interesting suggestion that there is some change in the disease progression from this therapy. We had also already shown that I couldn't show you that the, the power in this band is higher on the more affected hemisphere for these patients. We also had two patients who are very interesting controls. Parkinson starts on one side of the body. And they had both sides implanted, but they felt that they didn't need to turn on one of the sides. And so we had this unbridled opportunity to follow this beta rhythm over time where one side was stimulated and one side was not. And in fact, for one subject, here's the st stimulated side. And you can see this is his uh, initial beta peak. And over time, this seems to be being attenuated. In the latter part of the recordings, there seems to be some elevation in this alpha region. 
But this is his non-stimulated side. And here he is at the beginning. He actually attenuates initially at the 12 month, but at 18 and 24 months of following him, there's quite a dramatic increase in this beta band. And in actual fact, this is all done in a blinded fashion from when I see him in clinic. And at that 24 month mark, he said, you know, I'm beginning to feel some symptoms on my right side, and I think we should turn it on. So this was actually a very interesting control and also shows us that this is a dynamic disease-related marker. Can we use neurostimulation now as an investigative tool? So we know that high-frequency neurostimulation decreases the beta band power and it improves bradykinesia. Well, what if lower-frequency stimulation worsened bradykinesia and increased the beta band power? So of course, a lot of you who are skeptics there, and you should be, are sitting there waiting to ask me this question, which is, yes, but all of this is associative, it's not causative. And how do you do a causative experiment in these patients? So I thought, well, this is fabulous. This is like my co electrophysiological correlate of gene knock-in, knock-out experiments where we, that are used in genetics. And in actual fact, we had some information from resting state work that Zach Blumenfeld in my lab did that in actual fact, when we use 60 hertz uh, for stimulation, we actually did amplify portions of the beta band. So what I'm going to show you now is we, in our freely moving human subjects, we ask them to do this test, and we then ask them to do it on no stimulation during 60 hertz stimulation and 140 hertz stimulation. And this is my way of getting you to wake up, because I want you to watch this video and then tell me which stimulation you think made this person better. There's a little delay in this. Oh, it's good. So <clears throat> here's our subject sitting at rest. Here's his resting state band. And now he's about to move, and he's on no stimulation. And you can see his kinematics. And he's beginning to get slower. So this is difficult for him to do. And now he's going to be, this is during 60 hertz stimulation. And now you're going to see him at high frequency. We use 140 hertz. All right. So hands up if you think he did better on 60 hertz and 140 hertz. All right. You're both right. So, well, you're not quite both right. But anyway, so here he is. This is really just the spectrograms and the kinematics, the angular velocity traces. And in actual fact, across the group of subjects, both 60 hertz and 140 hertz improved the root mean square velocity of their movement and their frequency. But interestingly, the only 60 hertz made their performance more regular. An irregularity of performance in Parkinson's disease is one of the cardinal motor problems that people have. And I think you can kind of appreciate in this trace that, in fact, although he started off a little faster with the high frequency, it was harder for him to hold on to that. Well, what's the 50 million, you know, in my case, it would probably be the $100 question um, of what happened to the neural rhythms. So forget A for the moment. This is what, ha this is the averaged PSD, the grand average, during 60 hertz stimulation and during 140 hertz stimulation. And interestingly, both 60 hertz and 140 hertz attenuated a high beta band, but actually 60 hertz amplified this lower frequency range. So that now we have, for the first time, a way of investigating the circuitry and asking in these subbands, are they actually doing different things? So was it the high beta band that was responsible for the improvement? And in actual fact, another work done by Vladimir Litvak and groups with Meg and also LFP recording um, from London, he suggested that in fact that hyperdirect pathway is actually mediated by high beta frequencies and that the intrastriatal STN circuitry is more mediated by these lower beta frequencies. So for the very first time, we now are wondering whether in fact the therapeutic effect, as Viviana and Carl suggested a long time ago, is being mediated through the hyperdirect pathway. So what about 
other opportunities? Well, as I've been telling you, currently we really are kind of dumb with this therapy. It's a one-size-fits-all, it's open loop, it doesn't know what the brain is doing, it's on all the time. There's got to be something not terribly good for the brain to do that. And we use the same parameters even in depression and OCD. We use movement disorders parameters, which has always surprised me. So can we use the behavior or brain signals which are responsive for specific symptoms to drive more precise, customized neuromodulation for a broad range of neuropsychiatric diseases. And this is just a visual. Here's the generator that's recording these local field potentials from the brain. We've got these smart sensors that can record behavior. And so the first step to do this is we have to be safe. So every time we make a change, we go back through the FDA, and we are working in collaboration with Medtronic, who developed this bidirectional conduit, whereby the sensing neurostimulator could communicate with a PC, a portable PC. And we worked in collaboration with some engineers in Howard Chiswick's lab in the University of Washington, who were working with Medtronic with this Nexus D system just in the lab, and using a smartwatch um, with Bluetooth, Bluetooth enabled, had written the software and the hardware such that the PC could communicate with his smartwatch. And so Anka Velasar in my lab and Master Malak Mohammadi did a very nice study where we looked at resting tremor. We had the other side on so it wouldn't contaminate the signals here. And we measured resting tremor both of the leg and the hand, which was sensed by the, the PC. We had already pre-programmed safe, what we call control policy algorithms, how much voltage to tell the stimulator to increase to at what ramp, et cetera, et cetera. And we asked, can we, proof of principle, actually close the loop and drive the stimulator with a kinematic measure of movement disorders such as tremor? Now, I've spared you a lot of data slides, so don't get freaked out or leave. Um, this is voltage for 30 minutes. This is a measure of tremor. And what, what we do is we use a calibration period of resting tremor, and when we do a fast Fourier transform and get the average power of this, and then we determine thresholds. And the blue threshold, if the tremor goes above the blue threshold, we ask the stimulator to increase voltage as a faster ramp as the patient can tolerate. If it's in between these two thresholds, it does nothing. And if it goes below this threshold, it starts decreasing the, th the voltage. Here's an insert, basically, of this uh, trace. And you can see that as the, as the tremor went above the blue threshold, the voltage increased. And it increased or stayed the same following the tremor. It worked. And then as it went down below the threshold, we decreased the voltage. And we found that we needed to decrease the voltage with a slower ramp than increase. And across this small group, we showed that, in fact, adaptive or closed-loop DBS did improve tremor overall compared to no DBS. But there was quite a remarkable decrease in the amount of voltage that was used for these to do this uh, stimulation. This is how much we would have been using with continuous DBS. What was even more interesting to me was how different different people were. Even only among five subjects and 10 STNs, this is somebody who had this very intermittent tremor. The system worked, voltage went up, voltage went down, tremor stayed away, and you can see what was going on here. The stimulator really didn't need to be on that much. So here you have a person who's on continuous high-frequency stimulation 24-7 who may not need it very much. And although you can't see these numbers, this is basically the table showing the percentage time that the closed loop stimulator was on compared to when it would have been on open loop, which ranged from in one person 11% up to another who needed it basically on all the time. So this was our first look at how we really need to get better at customizing this therapy for different people. Well, so what about using the neural sig signals? And this has required, as I say, a lot of technological upgrades, which means we ha actually have to do firmware upgrade of the system of the INS itself, which means we need to go back to the FDA. We've actually done that in 19 subjects. And I'm going to show you the data from our very first, uh, world's first fully embedded closed loop deep brain stimulation procedure for Parkinson's disease using part of the beta band. I'm not telling you which part. And actually, our pioneering patient who allowed us to use his photograph is here. And I'm sure he'd be happy to talk to anybody who's interested. Um, and what we did was we used his own beta rhythm to drive the simulator, all embedded, no PC at this point. And so what you're going to see here is he's starting to move without any stimulation. And he's finding it very difficult. And I'm going to show you these kinematics in a minute, so I'm not going to go on for long. And now he's doing, he's moving with closed loop stimulation. 
And we did this for a full hour, asking him to do this at the 30 minute mark and at the one hour mark. And at the end of this, of course, nobody knew what the results were. I asked him if he would go home, not tell us right then, but go home and think about how he felt during that uh, hour of closed loop DBS. And I'm gonna show you what he said. The best analogy I thought of is like riding a 10 speed bike up a long hill climb. Just as you start feeling some fatigue and slowing, the gears automatically shift. The result is that you feel less resistance and have newfound stamina and energy. As you continue, it shifts again, and it seems to do this in advance of the fatigue. It's an amazing sensation. Now, he was on continuous DBS, and he was telling me that he was just wearing out on his long bike rides. So this was fascinating to me, but what was even more fascinating is what I'm gonna finish with and show you his kinematics, and this is a busy slide. So when he came in in the morning, he's on his clinical deep brain stimulation, and this is his rapid flexion extension movements for 30 seconds. And this is this, his average speed, this is his average frequency, this is the measure of regularity of his velocity and of his frequency, but notice this, we were using three active electrodes. We were using a very large field for him. We use closed loop DBS, we have to use one electrode so we can record around it. And I just want to show you what we saw at his 60 minute mark. And what we saw was what he said, which was when you see the variation in his clinical DBS, now this is on DBS, and then you compare it to this adaptive DBS, what blew me away was that he didn't, he, it was exactly what he said. He didn't seem to fatigue down. And this was borne out by the numbers. He was actually faster. His CVs dropped dramatically, and the lower they are, the more re regular he is, and his frequency was higher, and he was using about 40% of the power. And I did not expect this, but with all the work that we've done as skeptics to show that that beta band may have something to do with Parkinson's disease, it just took this one experiment that made me think there's something in it. But I'm still skeptical because probably the next person it's not gonna work at all. But anyway, I mean, you know, <laughs> this is an N of one, but I thought we'd show it because the, the result was really quite dramatic. And so I'd like to thank um, current and former members of my lab. I'd also like to shout out to my chair, Frank, who's been extremely uh, supportive of this work to my Stanford collaborators, especially Jamie Henderson, who's been very gracious about letting us do work in the operating room. And finally, and most importantly, to the people with Parkinson's disease who have volunteered many hours and of their time and energy, and without whom none of this research would be possible. And we think that we've just hit the tip of an iceberg for hopefully a very broad range of neuropsychiatric disease where following your own brain rhythm is actually going to be much more efficacious than we've been using for the last 30 years. And I'll stop, thank you. We have just a couple of minutes. Why don't we start with Jin and then we'll go to Nikos. Thank, thank you for the wonderful talk. Uh, in your adaptive stimulation scheme, you were just changing the power, not fre frequency. Is that something that you are thinking about changing? It was only power. It was power. Okay. There are technological reasons. There are technical reasons for this that this is a very slow process because uh, of really how we can do this at the moment, which is uh, Medtronic proprietary information. And are you able to try like a beta band stimulation to see if things get worse? Or we is have, that that's published, or it soon will be published with Zach's work. We can't record during 20 hertz stimulation. So we just did the kinematics for 20 hertz stimulation. When we did, we compared 2041 and, and 140, 2060, 140. And in actual fact, they did not get worse at 20 hertz. Thank you. I have two questions, if I may. Uh, the first one is, my understanding is this, almost one third of the patients, they get into trouble with psychiatric disorders, with mm. obesity, with depression, God knows what. Now, now that you can have all this wonderful method where you get basically a piece and you can study different features, can you optimize the localization of the electrodes so that you minimize these uh, adverse effects? That is an extremely good question and one that is very contentious among groups. Um, and 
a lot of groups say that they don't find this beta peak. That's actually why we did this very large study. And other groups would say, well, that's just because you've got the lead in the wrong place. There are a lot of limitations. We're using a fairly kind of crude electrode, no offense to Medtronic, which has four ring electrodes on it. There is now technological advances, as some of you may know, the Sapiens lead that has 32 disc electrodes around it. And there's been a fairly nice but very small paper in human subjects showing that there's a, a spatial topography of different bands of LFP around in the nucleus. And so I think it's possible that depending on whether you're measuring that hyperdirect pathway input site, whether you're measuring something anatomically that's reflective of other nuclei, right? You may be in silent spots that have nothing to do with not being in the sensory motor region. So we really don't know this in humans. It's much harder in, you know, the beta band, beta is a sensory motor rhythm. So one would assume that if you're in limbic or associative regions, you should not find much beta. So the problem, of course, is you're not, you shouldn't go around and probe in the human subject. But I think, so Medtronic have been very interested in this because in the centers that they had, all very good centers, very good outcomes, they saw a really, really wide range of the power in the signal and also the number of subjects for whom there was a beta band. And this has been something that has been difficult for the centers that didn't see it because they, they say their patients are doing well. So Medtronic is actually pulling all the imaging and all the electrophysiological data together precisely to see if they can actually help the field in general with a more standardized way, if there is one, of where to place the lead. But it's very difficult because, you know, people don't want to be told that they're not doing something right. Ask me later. Hi. Um, I'm interested in the crossover between what you're seeing in the Parkinson's VBS and the dystonia yeah. VBS for obvious reasons. Yes. Um, thank you for that question. We actually did publish a study showing recording uh, resting states in people with dystonia. Actually, it was secondary dystonia, generalized dystonia, and showed, in fact, that there was a beta band in all but one person who didn't respond, who'd had a childhood encephalitis. So the, the word, though, in the literature is that in dystonia, the rhythm is of a lower frequency. We're not so sure about that. Um, we did actually see a beta in those, in those people as well. Well, maybe it's, thank you very much. Let's thank okay. Helen. For, for more, please visit us at stanford.edu.